when we learn about the past, when we're looking at the extraordinary achievements of so many ancient civilizations, whether it's the pyramids, whether it's this amazing art, by you know grounding us and giving us that sense of perspective, I really wanted to give people some hope. Hello, I'm Bonnie Urbe. Welcome to To the Contrary, this week, Space Archaeology. I'm joined by Sarah Parkak, an archaeologist, Egyptologist, and professor at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. She's known for her work using satellites to identify archaeological sites. And she now has a new book out, Archaeology from Space, How the Future Shapes Our Past. Welcome, Sarah, to To the Contrary. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, a joy to have you here. Uh, let's start with how did you get interested in archaeology? I've been interested ever since I was a young child. You know, I was a child of the 80s. This is pre-cable, pre-internet, where you could watch cool YouTube videos. So I think it was partly National Geographic and partly the Indiana Jones movie that, that got me interested in ancient Egypt. And speaking of Indiana Jones, you are referred to as the satellite girl and the female Indiana Jones. How do you feel about that? Well, I mean, satellite girl is, is problematic on so many <laughs> levels. Fortunately, that was when I was younger in my, in my career. Uh, and, you know, Indiana Jones now is also problematic. Um, but I think, you know, it was a way that my generation got interested in archaeology. I think we need a, a new Indiana Jones movie starring a, a woman, ideally a woman of color. Um, but, you know, I, I think anything you can do to get kids in your classes and get kids excited about, about the work you're doing, well, that's a win. Um, now, you uh, say you have, I, there may be as many as 50 million sites worldwide that have not been discovered. I didn't even know there were people on the planet, that many people on the planet back in, you know, 2000 BC. How could they have not been discovered by now? So population experts have, have estimated that potentially, you know, 100 plus billion people have lived throughout human history. And you have to think they're living on a, an area of over, I think it's 40 million square kilometers for tens of thousands of years. Um, and then when you look at the density of archaeological sites in countries like the UK that have been well mapped, you can kind of come up with these estimates. And these aren't, aren't all sites like, you know, the pyramids of Giza or major sites that you might see in Central America. This is everything from tiny little campsites all the way up to major settlements. So it's just a rough estimate. I'm happy to be proved wrong, but actually I think I may have underestimated. What's it like being a woman in your field? Because science generally is, is sort of the last frontier and sort, certainly a confluence as you have put together of tech science as well as archaeology. Um, should be, I would imagine, you're one of the few women, right? There are not as many women in positions uh, that, you know, where you're a full professor, um, certainly working in a country like Egypt. Um, there are not a lot of female uh, project directors. But I certainly have been helped along the way by a lot of uh, other female academics. Um, there are extraordinary young women that are coming up through the ranks in grad school, junior professors. So I try to, you know, women have broken ceilings before me. I'm trying to help clear the way, as Michelle Obama s said, you know, as we rise, we bring others with us. It's not easy. It still isn't easy to be a woman in academia. Um, but I'm at the point in my career where I don't care what men think of me anymore. So I just keep trying to shine a light. And also, you know, I really do my best to promote the work, the extraordinary work that my other female colleagues are doing. Uh, how do you do that? Um, so certainly whenever I give a public presentation, I talk about the work that my colleagues are doing. I'm very active on social media, on Facebook, on Twitter. Um, so I'm constantly retweeting, um, trying to you know show people the work they're doing. Also in my book, um, I really tried to do a, a, both a, a diversity and gender audit. So I made sure to feature as many indigenous and female scholars as possible when I was talking about other people's work. How were there were some uh, ancient societies run by women? I know that because we were trying to get funding for many years, and it was many years ago about real women who actually existed and ruled civ ancient civilizations and um, and made an impact somehow. But for example, Wu Tse Chen in China, uh, or 
uh, Hatshepsut in Egypt, supposedly one of maybe potentially three women who ruled, some say, disguised as men on the throne. When there was a woman in charge of these ancient civilizations, did women do any better? Um, I think they certainly had challenges. You know, Hatshepsut, um, when, when she ruled Egypt, she presented as a man, and certainly... Do we know that for a fact? Because, uh, And tell me how we know that for right. a fact. Because when we were looking into this, as I say, a good 20 years ago, um, it, there was a debate going on. Right, and, and it's still debated in, in Egyptology to what extent was she feminized. And certainly when you look at her statues, they are more graceful. Um, I, with my eye, because I've, I've seen a lot of these statues, you can, you can see that it is a woman, but she wore certainly the regalia of a male ruler. Um, and, you know, was she, what, how was she deposed? Did she die of natural causes? This is all sort of grist for the scholar's mill. Um, but look at the extraordinary monuments that she built, you know, at Daryl Bakri, this ex- beautiful temple where she celebrates this voyage to Punt, which is quite a, an achievement going back 3,400, 3,500 years. So, you know, just like today, the debates are raging, how much can, can women be feminine when they're in positions of power? I say, you know, give us 10,000 years and we'll see if we've done as well or better than the men have for the last <laughs> 10,000. And as I recall, she elevated the position of priestesses in her religion, correct? Am I? Well, so, um, so we know certainly in, in the New Kingdom, um, there, there was a group of women called the Chantresses of Amun. Um, so we, we do know of, um, you know, of women that were in charge, um, or certainly had important roles as singers in temples. Um, women in ancient Egypt were known as mistresses of the house. And lest we think, you know, these women were just housebound and didn't do anything, many women, um, were in charge of household accounts. And in some cases, we have inscriptions or, or letters. You know, we know the women were literate and they were helping to run the household businesses or the businesses of their families while their husbands were gone. And while we're there for a second, Sarah, Let's pause because in 1994, executive producer Carrie Stein and I were in Egypt covering the UN Conference on Population and Development. And while we were there, we went down to Deir al-Bari and we did a feature on Hatshepsut. Here's a piece of it. Here in the Valley of the Kings, a pharaoh's power was measured by the size of the monuments he left behind. Among the most stunning, the temple Deir al-Bari meaning the sublime of the sublimes. It was built by the female pharaoh, Hatshepsut. Hatshepsut was born a princess in 1484 BC. When her father died, one of her half-brothers, Tutmosis II, became pharaoh. As was customary among royalty at the time, Tutmosis II married his half-sister, Hatshepsut. The two ruled jointly, a testament to Hatshepsut's power, but they never produced a son. So when Tutmosis II died eight years into their marriage, power passed to his son by a concubine. Tutmosis III was too young to rule, so originally Hatshepsut took power as regent. But not content to warm the throne for someone else, she usurped power for herself and became pharaoh. At first, she's depicted in royal dress, appearing as a woman. Later, she wears the full pharaonic regalia, including the false beard that was one of the symbols of divine kingship and is referred to as Her Majesty the King. Hatshepsut took power at one of the peak periods of wealth and power in pharaonic Egypt's history. Her imperial power, her country's wealth, and incredible cultural and artistic achievements have led to her description by some historians as towering above the ancient world as its most outstanding female personality. She did not want to be remembered for her military achievements. Clearly, there were military campaigns during her 22-year rule, but she wanted to be remembered as someone who opened up new trade routes to other parts of Africa. This scene depicts her sea expedition to the land then called Punt, which is present-day Somalia. Egyptologist Betsy Bryan of Johns Hopkins University says this trip was significant because it was the first ever sea voyage to that part of Africa from Egypt they were accessing gold directly from Nubians who were um, who were panning for it and the Egyptians were collecting it there at a time when they were only beginning 
their own conquest and control of the Nubian gold mines. Elsewhere at Deir al-Bahri, hieroglyphics tell of Hatshepsut's mining expeditions north to Sinai for turquoise and south to Aswan for granite to build obelisks. But she also wanted to be remembered for her elevation of the status of some Egyptian women. Scholars say the number of elite women involved in the prestigious and extremely powerful cult service spiked up during her reign. Small figures in procession portray women clapping, doing acrobatics, and playing musical instruments. Okay, we're back now. Sarah, please tell me. Wu Tian, are you familiar with her in China? A little bit, yes. Okay. Uh, I, she's, her reputation was that she <laughs> murdered or had murdered most of her relatives whom she feared were trying to challenge her for her power. She started as a concubine, as many of these women did, then got in with a general and he ditched his wife or whatever they did and married her. And then when he died, she rose to power. Um, so I would assume a woman like that running uh, the, the government, running the civilization would not have been particularly good to women. I mean, when you when you look at other other women in history, you know the the famed Cleopatra, who we know through I mean, a lot of people know her mainly as, as she was portrayed by Elizabeth Taylor in the movie in the 1960s. A lot of people don't realize that she was an extraordinarily brilliant woman. She spoke multiple languages. Um, she apparently was not uh, as good looking. She had a hooked nose. She had very distinctive facial features, but her charisma and her brilliance would win over a room. I think there are a lot of parallels one can draw between someone like Cleopatra and, say, someone like Hillary Clinton. Um, you know, people do what they need to do in positions of power, and women can be extraordinarily shrewd. And it's amazing how we interpret female rulers like Cleopatra through the lens of how we're thinking about women today. Um, are there other women rulers who stand out for you I haven't mentioned? Boy, um, you know, I know in, in ancient Egypt, towards the end of the Old Kingdom, um, there was a, a, a female queen, um, certainly during uh, the, the, the New Kingdom, the Great Age of Imperialism, and later there were very powerful women who, um, you know, helped necessarily rule, uh, but certainly had pretty significant um, positions of power. So the Queen Nefertiti, alongside her husband Akhenaten, um, she was a very powerful woman, and you can you can really get that sense by looking at her sculpture. Mm -hmm. um, now tell me about. Let's go to Egypt, which is your your personal favorite. Um, t how many more sites? I mean, that's a country that's been dug up fairly consistently since King Tut's tomb was discovered, and certainly before that by tomb raiders. Um, what made Tut so famous, as I understand it, was not that he was a particularly powerful king, he didn't live that long, but because his tomb was found intact, and many of the others in the Valley of the Kings and Queens, the Valley of the Dead, had been raided already. How much more is down there, do you believe, that hasn't been raided that you have found um, on satellite. Right. Well, so first of all, a lot of people think King Tut's tomb was intact, and it wasn't. Oh, it wasn't. Uh, okay, no, so thank when, you. So when, when Howard Carter um, excavated the tomb after the discovery in 1922, almost 100 years ago, he found hand scoop marks in the unguent jars. So people had gone into the tomb, probably the burial party. You can't steal a gold amulet with the name Tut on it because someone's going to know you've stolen it. But they stole the perfume and creams that were in the tomb, and those handprints were there, you know, three and a half thousand years later, which is kind of amazing. Um, I think, you know, when you when you calculate the amount of, of area of sites that's been excavated, I have, and this isn't a peer-reviewed publication, no one's disputed it yet, I calculated that even in the Egyptian Delta, we've only excavated one one-thousandth of one percent of the sites, and I've got the math to prove it. And um, when you add on top of that all the other archaeological sites that we still have to find, we see big announcements of discoveries all the time by the Ministry of Antiquities. I think we can safely say that in Egypt, we've excavated less than 1% of the sites. That is so amazing with all the archaeologists who've yep. been crawling all over that country for uh, such a long time. Um, what you, do you see any of them on your explorer program that you've put together? 
Yes. Yeah, so, um, so with the with the survey work that we've been doing across Egypt, with the work my colleagues have been doing, you know, we, we see new sites all the time, and, and it's you know not necessarily just just Egypt. So, in the the platform that I run at work, we've we've done work in Peru. Um, it's a citizen science platform, and we found over nineteen thousand sites there. Um, so, I think every country in the world, um, you know, we're, we're going to be finding thousands and thousands of sites. But certainly in Egypt, you know, it seems like every week there's a new tomb or a new pyramid that my colleagues in the Ministry of Antiquities have discovered. And, and when you see them from space, as you do on your program, uh, and I know you invite other people to go to your site because the more eyeballs there are out there looking for the, you know, to cover millions of square miles, the more, the more quickly uh, sites will be discovered. But um, what do you, how do you do it? I mean, is it just dots where they have been dug out already or... So, or what? so, so from, from space, there are two ways that you can identify archaeological sites. So in archaeology, we go from the known to the unknown. So we have databases of lots of known sites and features. And it's not like, you know, you're, you're at a doctor's office and they're telling you that a squirrely blob is whatever they're telling you it is. These things are really distinct for the most part. You're seeing squ uh, squares, rectangles, shapes that aren't found in nature, right? So you see a square, it's this size, it's just this shape, it's this orientation. Oh, it looks like these 20 known examples. Also, a lot of these things are buried beneath the ground. And what we're doing is we're looking for subtle chemical differences on the surface that are caused by the degrading of the buildings, whether they're mud brick or stone. And so think of it almost like a, a space-based CAT scan, where we're seeing these subtle differences in parts of the light spectrum that we can't see with our human eyes. So both it's shape recognition and using the chemical signature of the soils. And what, how, do you expect to find like another Deir al-Bahri or the uh, Ramses II's tomb that they dug up from the Nile and put on top of the hill when they were about to dam the Nile. Um, I mean, major monuments like right. that. So for the most part, um, the sites that we map and find, you know, it's it's foundations. Um, sites like huge pyramids, you know, like a huge temple or or like a pyramid of Giza. Uh, you know, I never say never because you never <laughs> you never know. Um, but I think for the most part, you know, we're we're not going to find another uh, a pyramid like Khufu's. Certainly um, out in the desert, um, at other sites, my colleagues have found temples, but these aren't like magnificent structures like Karnak. These are foundations, you know, smaller temples, smaller smaller column bases. But there, there are a number of these sites that are out there. But you never know. I, I'm, like I said, I'm always happy to be proved wrong. Uh, yeah, do you, is there any possibility that any of the eight wonders of the world could be dug up, like the, the bronze statue in... Greece somewhere that and and parts of which were found and used, for, you know, melted down and and the right. metal was reused. But anything like that that you think that you're looking for the Ark of the Covenant or any of those things? You know, I think you know obviously the pyramids of the Giza, pyramids of Giza are the only standing wonder of the world. Um, you know, we see hints of. You know, some of the sites that are that are mentioned, you know, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, certainly there's a lot of archaeology left to do at the site of Babylon. Um, but I think a lot of the wonders are 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 simply gone. But you never you never know what archaeologists might find. You know, there was just an amazing discovery found. I think it was in Iraq um, with receding waters. There was a major temple from thousands and, and site from thousands of years ago that just appeared. Um, so with changing water tables, um, you, you never know what might be out there. What, now, civiliz civilization actually began, I believe it was Iraq, right? The, um, Ur, the city Ur, where the first writing, um, actually, I learned that while up at your alma mater, Yale. I was interviewing a professor up there, and he pulled out these drawers of, right. you know, of these, the little uh, round-shaped clay pieces that they, that they made back then and the first examples of human writing in clay? Well, Egyptologists will, will debate that slightly in that um, around the exact same time at a site called Abydos, um, which is not quite in between Cairo and Luxor, but, but pretty much in the middle, um, there were the graves of Egypt's earliest kings that ruled. And we have a lot of examples of early writing from there. So what came first, the chicken or the egg? Where did writing start? You know, I think it's fascinating that early writing systems evolved um, in similar places at around the same time. It's debated, did they have contact with each other? 
again, we have a lot of evidence left to uncover. Um, but it's, it's amazing that these great civilizations, you know, essentially launched with the advent of writing roughly 5,000 years ago. But even if it's a competition, for example, between Egypt and, and uh, Iraq, it's still the, the Levant, the, yeah, it's the, the Levant, Middle East. Yeah, it's that area, yes. So why do you think civilization started there? Um, I think for certainly in, in Egypt, you know, think of Egypt today, it's a gigantic oasis and you have amazing resources. You've got the Nile River, you know, it flooded pretty regularly. Uh, it's good. It's a good place to, um, to settle, to have uh, crops, to have uh, other, other animals. And when your food um, isn't at risk, when you don't have to, to migrate and move around, you know, culture um, can really explode and you start getting uh, leaders and specialists and craftspeople. And over time, that naturally leads to communication because if you want to send, you know, 300 jugs of wine to another place and make sure it gets there, you've got to put markings on it, right? You've got to start keeping track of things. It's all about business and bureaucracy. <laughs> so you can blame all the good luck in Washington, D.C. on Egypt from 5,000 years ago. Now, with developing your program and getting, I would imagine, uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of social media users involved in the hunt for old civilization. Um, tell me what imprint you think you have made on your field and, uh, and, and how you hope that will change things in the future. So I, I hope, you know, broadly speaking, you know, given all the challenges that we're facing right now with with climate change, with migration, with um, the rise of nationalism. There's so much tension in our society. Um, what I hope that the world gets out of using our citizen science platform and you know me and, and others speaking more publicly about archaeology is that archaeology matters. You know, when we learn about the past, when we're looking at the extraordinary achievements of so many ancient civilizations, whether it's the pyramids, whether it's this amazing art, um, we're, we're gaining an appreciation for the diversity of culture and all the amazing things that people from different cultures can bring to the table and how they've helped our society to evolve. So by you know grounding us and giving us that sense of perspective, I really want it to give people some hope. Um, I don't want to be Pollyanna and be like, everything's going to be fine. We don't need to do anything. But when we're, when we're afraid, when, we, when we're you know, ground down by everything that's going on around us, we're stuck. We can't see past that. And that's what I want archaeology to, to give us is some perspective so we can have a little hope and get unstuck and think, okay, we're, we're resilient, we're creative, this is part of who we are. Um, and do you think, you, I, I saw mentioned somewhere that you believe the future is, uh, you can be predicted to a certain extent by the past? Tell me about that. So, you know, the world is cyclical, right? You know, we're, um, uh, what, what did the Princess Bride say? Never start a land war in Asia, <laughs> and, and it never ends. <laughs> um, I, I think by understanding the past, by understanding patterns of, of leadership, you know, when you study ancient Egypt, the pharaohs were all bragging uh, on walls and making gross exaggerations, and nothing appears to have changed in thousands of years, just a slightly different wall that people are posting on. Um, so by understanding leadership, by understanding how people's um, reacted to periods of climate change, I think it can give us a lot, a, a better sense of where we are now and where we might go. Um, we're, there's all this talk of space exploration, and the terminologies we're using are reflective of uh, 500 years plus of um, very colonialist exploration. We need new terminologies. We need new ways of thinking about exploring. Um, so I'm hopeful that by studying archaeology and by creating new vocabularies, you know, we can think better about how we may explore not just here, but other worlds. Beyond what you just explained, what would you like to, uh, what kind of imprint would you like to make on the field? Discovering a major civilization or uh, you tell me. I, I think, you know, if, if the impact that I can have um, on, on the field and the world is getting countries and governments to invest more in cultural heritage. Um, you know, the cultural heritage, there's a big report that just came out and said it was something like an 80 or $100 billion a year industry. For every dollar that's invested in heritage and archaeology, you know, it gets, re gets returned tenfold or more. Um, by visiting these sites, you know, when you stand there in front of the pyramids of Giza, no matter who you are, no matter what your political bent is, it doesn't matter, you can't help but feel awe and, and feel so in debt to these amazing people that came 
before us. So broadly speaking, I want to make people feel awe again. I want to make people feel um, feel that, that they can be inspired by the great achievements of everyone that came before us. You know, it's not necessarily what we find, it's what we find out. And what we find out is that we're the same people that lived in East Africa 300 years ago. We're still the same species. 300 thousand years ago. <laughs> right. So, right. you know, in spite of our iPhones, in spite of our technology, um, we're, we're a community-based species, and I hope people, by understanding the past, can understand that, and maybe it'll help to bring us together a little bit more. Terrific. Thank you so much, Sarah Park Act. Really appreciate your time and what you're doing for the world. Thank you so much for having me here. <laughs> and that's it for this edition of To the Contrary. Please follow me on Twitter and visit our website, pbs.org slash to the contrary. And whether you agree or think to the contrary, see you next week. Funding for To the Contrary provided by the Cornell Douglas Foundation, committed to encouraging stewardship of the environment, land conservation, watershed protection, and eliminating harmful chemicals. Additional funding provided by the Wallace Genetic Foundation, the Colcom Foundation, and the Charles A. Freoff Foundation. For a transcript or to see an online version of this episode of To the Contrary, please visit our PBS website at pbs.org forward slash to the contrary. Be more PBS. <laughs>